Okay, um, we'll go ahead and get started now since it's 4.30. Um, hello, I'm Karen, and this is Sujith. We're part of the orchestration team at Robinhood, um, where we manage our Kubernetes clusters. And today, what we'll be talking about is going through the journey of how um, Robinhood's strategy for Kubernetes um, authorization and authentication has evolved. So to give you a little bit of context, um, Robinhood decided as a company to actually start using Kubernetes at the end of 2018. And the design decision was to have um, our own self-managed Kubernetes clusters on top of AWS, and that's still what we are using today. And we went with a multi-tenant model, so each application gets its own namespace, and every application has a corresponding team that owns it. And a team might own multiple namespaces if they have multiple applications. So um, yeah, in case you can't see it, the top is the Kubernetes resources, and um, the two boxes inside are the namespaces. And here at the bottom, um, I have Google Groups because at that point in time, um, that was something that already existed in the company. Um, each team had a corresponding Google Group and this Google group was used for things like um, emailing and also using Google Calendar. So we decided to leverage the already um, existing Google groups and use that to um, get access to the Kubernetes clusters and associated namespaces. So because we wanted to have each team to have access to the namespaces they own, we created a cluster role for this um, namespace admin, and that included things that a regular application team might need, like managing their pods. And we also created a role binding in every single namespace to bind to that cluster role and use the Google groups. But um, this covers application teams, but you might be wondering um, what about infrastructure teams that might have needs to access resources across several namespaces or even to manage cluster-wide resources. And for that, we used a cluster role called admin role, which is very similar to the built-in cluster admin cluster role, which gives um, permissions to do literally anything in the cluster via the wildcard verbs and resources. And the Google group on the bottom right is the infrastructure team, and they are the ones that have access to this. So um, this was our initial design, and that worked fine when Robinhood was a small startup with very few engineers. But as the company grew, this um, initial design was no longer going to work. And the, one of the primary reasons for that is that our infrastructure team grew by 4x and more. Um, and this meant that if we kept our initial design, there would be too many engineers that have full cluster admin access. So we needed to do something about this and change our security posture. So what I have here is a table comparing um, our original access policy. And I say that in quotes because it was not a formalized access policy, mainly because it was pretty straightforward. We just defined admin access as people who had full permissions to do anything cluster-wide. And the people who were allowed to have this admin access um, was the, well, I put it as plural, but really there was one infrastructure team in the beginning. Um, and non-admins, so application teams, just had their own namespace scoped permissions. Um, and we created a new access policy because of the problem that we didn't want to give so many engineers full cluster-wide access. Um, and because this was more complicated than our original policy, we needed to put it in a formal document. And one thing we started with was to actually uh, modify our definition of what admin access means. So we separated this into two categories. So the first category is first order admin access. And what I mean by first order is that someone who has access via a direct cluster role binding reference has um, first order access. And that's not enough for defining what admin access means. Um, so we had a second category called second order. And um, as an example of second order access, um, someone who can um, manage the resources within highly privileged namespaces like KubeSystem can be considered to have second order access because they can um, touch things like the API server. So after we defined 
redefined what admin access means. We also had to um, set or decide who actually gets to have this admin access. And we wanted to make it something more complex than just granting to infrastructure teams. So we had finer grain guidelines for that, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. We kept our policy for application teams the same because those were just namespace scope permissions and that was not a security concern. So the way we approached um, the problem between um, getting from where we stood to um, achieve our new access policy is we enumerated the things that we had to do and we ranked it um, in order of priority. So we wanted to tackle the solutions that would give us quick wins. So things that were low effort would, would give us high impact. And the first step to do this was to um, enforce fine-grained admin access. And what that means is instead of granting um, full wildcard access to infrastructure teams is, is to actually create an allow list of permissions instead to follow the principles of least privilege. And the first step to do that was to actually survey um, the existing state. We wanted to see what different Google groups existed for the various infrastructure teams and look at where they were used in the RBAC resources. And to start with, we looked at a few open source tools. Um, we used KubeScan, which was actually a great starting point for identifying what sort of permissions um, we might want to look at more closely that teams had. But we did run into a few limitations here, one of which was that the results were noisy. So the custom cluster rule that we defined for application teams to use for namespace admin permissions would show up in the results. So it was listing a rule binding in every single namespace, so the results were very noisy. And there were also some feature gaps that we encountered where it didn't handle some edge cases well. We also um, looked at our back tool, but that also had limitations. So we ended up just writing our own, which was also useful for us to have um, custom logic like aggregating information across the different clusters that we have. So once we had the state of what it looked like, then we could actually start with um, making those fine-grained permissions and turning them into the RBAC resources. And we started out with asking groups which permissions they actually need, but I have this little question mark here because teams had no idea what they needed. Um, the problem with granting people um, <laughs> full wildcard permissions is that they don't really think about what they need access to because they can just do anything. Um, so we relied on, uh, we remind, relied on um, audit logs from the API server to see what historically these teams were accessing. And with that, we were able to define cluster rules for each team and create the corresponding cluster rule bindings. And part of this exercise of surveying the different um, cluster rules that existed, we actually found several cluster rules that were quite privileged and were no longer used. So we had to do a cleanup of those as well. And next, um, I'll hand it off to Sujith to talk about how we changed our access control mechanism for Kubernetes. Thank you. Uh, so, so far we looked at how our RBAC looked like, how we have leveraged RBAC to grant permissions to people. Now I'm gonna talk about how we designed a better access control mechanism. But before we get to that, I wanna talk about where we were, what we had to kind of understand how we went on to design something new. So initially, when we bootstrapped our clusters, we used Guard, which is a third-party webhook authenticator. So generally, the data flow looks like users make kubectl requests, and they pass in their ID token uh, as a better token to API server. And the API server uses the webhook configuration, which is passed as uh, a bunch of flags in the Kubernetes API server configuration. It reaches out to the webhook authenticator and forwards the ID token. So the webhook authenticator, in this case guard, is responsible for verifying the token, getting the relevant username from it, which is email for us. Um, and guard uses Google Groups, as we have already established. So it first checks if the domain in the username field is a valid domain. If the domain is valid, then it makes another follow-up follow API call to the Google admin directory API and lists all the groups that this email belongs to. And, this, and it injects these groups into the token review object and passes it back to API server, which uses this 
uh, list of groups and the RBAC configurations on the cluster to decide if the request should be authorized or not. So uh, the question here is, how would users be able to get this ID token to present in their kubectl request? Conveniently, God provided us a uh, binary, uh, which, is, uh, which is something you can invoke by running the command guard get token dash o google. Um, once you run this command, uh, it fetches the ID token and refresh token, which are redacted here for a good reason. Uh, the ID token is subject to expire, but the refresh token enables the kubectl to fetch a new one whenever the issued ID token expires without requiring any user intervention. Um, you may be imagining like, oh, why is the client ID and secret not redacted? Isn't it a secret, as it says in the field? Uh, looks like, no, it is not a secret. The reason being Guard is an OAuth client, uh, which is uh, a desktop application, essentially. So the client ID and the client secret uh, are hard-coded into the binary itself. And the client ID and secret are only used to get the ID token that the users can present when running the kubectl commands. So the best part about OAuth desktop app is it only runs against a local host redirect OAuth URL. So even if this client ID and secret are exposed, uh, all that can be done is invoking a local host request and updating the kube config file. So as you can see in the screenshot, uh, we have you, uh, the client ID and secret are hard coded. What does that mean? That means the client, OAuth client, is a single point of failure. And with any given single point of failures, what the risk is, if it goes down, it li literally takes down everything. And that's exactly what happened for us. So all of a sudden, all of our users started reporting that they're, OAuth, uh, they're not able to fetch the token or not unable to run any kubectl commands. And the error, very descriptively, is the OAuth client was deleted. Uh, luckily, we have a break glass system, so the admins were able to use this break glass to troubleshoot uh, what was happening in the clusters. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Google uh, uh, Guard runs as a pod on the control plane nodes, but the logs, even at a trace level, were only giving very basic information like the token uh, has been received uh, for review. Uh, as you would generally do, we try to turn everything off, which is delete all the Guard server parts, and spin them back up, but the issue was not resolved. So at this point, we started talking to the Google Cloud admins uh, in the company and trying to understand what happened to the auth client. As we were trying to look at the audit logs. We were not able to identify what happened to the Google client. Uh, a nugget of information that I want to add here is like this was set up in like late 2018, like Karen was mentioning. So none of us were around when this was established, so we had very limited idea of, of where this OAuth client is coming from. So that made it even more difficult for us to figure out. So then we engaged Google Cloud support, uh, but they were not able to provide any information. So what we ended up doing was we patched Guard locally, created our own OAuth client, built a binary out of it, and shipped it to every engineer's laptop for them to start authenticating again. But our hunt to find what happened to the auth client has not stopped there. We started reaching out to the Guard community to understand what happened. It's been a little over one year since we filed the issue, and it is still open, and we have no idea what happened to this auth client. As you can see uh, through these slides, uh, we are already reaching a point where the auth client situation is not ideal. Uh, you can also see that the tokens auto-refresh. That means uh, it is not necessarily that the tokens have short-lived access. The tokens can be retrieved without any MFA. Uh, from an operational standpoint, it was very difficult for us to look at the logs or understand uh, what is going on from the Guard server perspective. Also, Guard runs as a control plane component, so that's an additional add-on for us to maintain, and you can imagine how cluster add-ons lifecycle work, so it's a lot of overhead for us to maintain and support it. So with this, we have decided to stop using Guard. All this calls for figuring out what the new system should look like. So all of us came together and chalked up the requirements for the new Auth and, and AuthZ system that we want to use. So the three key things that we were starting to look at are, from a security perspective, we wanted groups but we don't want them to be used for anything but Kubernetes cluster access. Then we wanted to have short-lived access and have MFA associated with it. 
but the token lifetime is a big challenge. Like we don't want to be too secure that it expires every minute when you're actively performing actions. We don't want it to be too long that it is not, it is going to be a security risk all over again. Uh, the third aspect is the reliability. We wanted more auditability, observability, as well as we want the system, the IDP, to be able to handle the load that is presented to it. So it, uh, we narrowed down to using either Okta or AWS for this use case, and we also wanted to use OIDC, which is OpenID Connect. Uh, the best part about OIDC, as quoted here from Kubernetes document, uh, is that the ID token once it's, it's retrieved, Kubernetes does not need to call back the identity provider, so there is no overhead for us in terms of managing another cluster add-on of any kind. So after debating and experimenting and evaluating, we have decided to use Okta, which is very standard with other things that we use. Uh, so the best part about API server is it allows us to use multiple authenticators. So the we were continuing to, for the migration, we kept the webhook authenticator as is so that we don't disrupt people's workflows, but we added new OIDC flags to the API server configuration, which include the issue or URL and the client ID, which is per environment. It's a conscious choice. We could be more granular, but we chose per environment. And we used email and groups as the means of validating the tokens as well as using them for authorization. So uh, let's look at the data flow now. So the user logs into IDP. Uh, then IDP provides the user with the ID token, refresh token, and an access token. When the user makes the kubectl calls, like before, they present the ID token. Um, and as a bearer token, now the API server looks at the bearer token, and it is now able to validate the JOT, which is JSON web token uh, that is presented uh, in the ID token. The reason that API server is able to do it is because during the bootstrapping, we provide a bunch of OIDC flags. So when it's first bootstrapping and uh, starting to run, uh, it sets up a handshake with the IDP and gets all the relevant secrets to be able to validate the JART signature. So once it verifies that the JART is valid, then it looks if the JART is expired. If it is not expired, then we use the Google Groups in the claims that we mentioned before to authorize the user and let them perform the actions. So this is how a sample ID token looks like. AUD is the OAuth client ID. The email is the email of the user who is performing the action. The groups are the list of groups that the uh, email is associated with. But the question goes back to uh, how can user get this ID token and present uh, it to API server? So to be able to support this, we used uh, another open source project called Cube Login, which is essentially a kubectl plugin that we can use to perform OIDC login. So on the client side, they use the same issuer URL and the client ID that we have configured on the API server. And we try to extract the email and groups from this OIDC login request and make sure these are available in the token that they're present. So as you can imagine, with any new system, there will be challenges. Uh, so even for this new system that we try to build and migrate, we ran into some challenges. Surprisingly, not from a migration perspective, but essentially from a perspective of how do we do authorization. We already have these groups. And these groups are exclusive to Kubernetes access, so we wanted to see how we want to fit them into the role bindings and cluster role bindings uh, Karen just talked about. So we tried to do the same access. We tried to talk to people, uh, try to understand what they want. We also did not want uh, all the cluster uh, admins to have the same group, so we wanted to kind of break it down further and make it more granular. But the challenge with this is how would the group ownership work? Like, will the users be granted access as an as in their, their onboarding into the company? Or how do we do this? And also, what is the lifetime of this access? So initially, we made it easy for ourselves, and we said everybody has persisted, persistent privileged access. But very soon, we are like, yes, this is a good step forward for the migration, but we wanted to make it better. So. We took on ourselves a challenge on how we want to remediate 
uh, persistent privileged access. Karen? Thanks. Okay, so um, now that we have, um, now that we have switched over from using Google Groups to Okta Groups, that enables us to actually um, provide something called um, just-in-time privileged access. And um, the reason that we wanted to do this, so kind of going back to when we restructured our access policy, um, part of the um, fine-grained um, uh, part of the policy for admin access is that there are some uh, privileged permissions cluster-wide um, that infrastructure teams don't need all of the time, but they might have legitimate use cases for um, if a system is down, if they need to help a team debug, if they're setting something up um, that's new. And so for that, we need to provide these users um, a way to just request that access temporarily only while they need it and then have that expire. Um, automatically. So I'll do um, a walkthrough of what that flow looks like. So up here on the screen, um, a user still makes um, an access request the way that they would normally um, to join the user group, the Okta user group. And then once they are added to that group, then they can refresh their Okta ID token to actually pick up that group membership information. And then they can use um, kubectl commands as normal to get the permissions that the group that they just joined um, has. And where the just-in-time system comes in is the access, the automatic access revocation part. So we use the automatic group expiration tooling to actually periodically check if the user's access request has expired or not. And um, this is something that we are actually working on rolling out and onboarding currently. And the initial challenges that we faced were, were actually not related to the technology part. It was entirely cultural. We faced a lot of pushback from the teams that we talked to at first. And um, that's expected because who likes it <laughs> when you take away permissions from them and you know, add some friction to their process. So similar to when we were designing the actual Google Groups, when we went and talked to the users to see how they felt, we did the same thing here. We talked to the users, asked them what their pain points were, kind of presented like what we want to the user flow to look like, and listened to their feedback. And we had a POC where we had people actually experience that user flow, and we modified it based on their feedback as well. So. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the takeaways overall from this um, whole journey and um, ongoing process. So like I just mentioned, um, I think it's really important to talk to the users. Um, I'm not sure about your teams, but I think um, it's easy to work in a silo and just kind of like work on the projects that you want to do and um, feel like are right for the users, but it's really important to take their feedback into consideration. Um, but a caveat here is, um, you should sometimes take <laughs> what they say with a grain of salt. Um, one thing that we encountered when we were actually surveying users on um, what permissions they need and how they want the structure to look at, sometimes what they were telling us didn't actually match the data that we were looking at. So um, do incorporate user feedback, but also <laughs> look at the data and fact check. And another takeaway is it's really important to implement um, both best practices for both um, RBAC in general and for infrastructure. Um, for RBAC, one thing that we are moving towards is to actually not let people um, have their individual um, individual names like referenced in the role bindings, and we want to rely more on the Okta groups now because the Okta groups have that automatic expiration and have better governance on who is allowed to be in which group. So outside of testing environments, we really um, are leaning in on the um, Okta groups. And another infrastructure best practice, which you're probably aware of, is to use continuous deployment and have things checked into code. But we really felt the pain of um, how in the past, um, when Robinhood was first starting out, how some of the manual processes like really came to hurt us later. Because when we were doing the cleanup of the unused cluster rules, it was really, really hard to trace back um, what those rules were used for. We really had to hunt through logs to see which ones were in use. Um, and 
funny but not really that funny story is when I was doing the cleanup, I actually accidentally removed a cluster role that was still in use. And, <laughs> and because the, it was not on continuous deployment, it had to be recreated manually and we had to backport it into code. So um, yeah, really important to check in all of your resources as code and have it on CD. And um, another learning that we took away, um, which we actually implemented when we moved to Octa Groups, is to have proper governance on user groups. So um, besides the reliability and issues and the operational toil that we saw with um, using Google Groups with Guard, is that um, the governance of Google Groups was difficult because the Google Groups were not used um, just for a Kubernetes cluster. Um, like we mentioned earlier, it's just part of the regular onboarding process to get added to your team's Google Group because you, know, you need it for mailing and for calendar events. Um, but beyond that, there were other problems where people might get added to other teams' Google Groups because they're interested in like the events that they're um, interested in their team's events and want to see it show up on their calendar as well. So it was pretty messy, and it wasn't exactly a one-to-one -one mapping of teams, um, what, who was actually in a team and that team's corresponding Google Group. So by switching over to Okta Groups and having a better policy for who can create those user groups and um, how people get added and removed from those groups, we moved away from those problems. And lastly, um, having a way to provide, um, providing a way to request temporary access is very important for the privileged access which people might need um, only temporarily. And um, it's not, a good security practice to grant those all the time, but you still want to provide a way to users to get these permissions because they do have legitimate reasons um, to use those and you don't want to um, have too much toil in their process. So yeah, these are all the takeaways that we had and it is still an ongoing process, so I'm sure <laughs> we will learn more. And oh yeah, quick blurb, we are hiring. So check out our careers page and now opening up the floor if anyone has any questions. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, I wonder if you can elaborate what was the timeline of adoption of this new authorization approach and how you scheduled it? Um, are you referring from the migration to the Okta groups? Yes. Um, when did we start? <laughs> yeah, so as mentioned before, uh, there are two means of, uh, API server allows you to have more than one authentication mechanism, so it was very transparent from a user perspective. So we added the new ORDC-based authorization and authentication, but we continue to support the old uh, means of doing things. And we did a lot of dog footing. We adopted within our infra teams and eventually onboarded like into the application team so that uh, we know all the pains of doing uh, the wrong things, fixing it, and making it better for everyone. So I would say end to end it was a, a, around like six months of migration from it when it began versus when we ripped off guard entirely from our ecosystem. Thank you. Uh, forgive me if this is a stupid question, but uh, I heard earlier that you were uh, based in GCP. Did you have any problems with uh, like GCP project rule, uh, roles granting like additional access to users that um, you were, like, weren't intending on a project by project basis or anything like that? Um, so we were using GCP only for um, using Guard. Like our Kubernetes clusters themselves are not like managed on Google. Yeah, for Guard to be able to have certain service account to be able to kind of make those Google API calls is the only use case where we use the GCP projects. Okay, cool. Thank you. Are you guys worried about the amount of groups you're adding to individual users and kind of blowing up those OIDC tokens? So some type of like principal store versus, I guess, this kind of RBAC approach? Yeah, so that was definitely something that we looked into when we were actually designing the Okta groups. Um, and that's part of like the data collection that we were talking about, where if like we had gone with um, like every single, you know, cluster rule gets an Okta group, then some teams that are like, why well, want like all of these permissions, they'd be in, you know, like, I don't know, 40 <laughs> Okta groups or something like that. So, um, but those are, those are the edge cases, right? So for the majority of users, they are in their team-based Okta group and that's all they need to be in. But um, for the edge cases, we kind of had to find the balance between um, 
like being in too many groups. So um, we decided there that for certain cluster rules, we might want to just have, um, we, would, we would have the group associated with that team like used in that cluster rule, if that answers your question. Okay, and then I guess what is the process for not creating too many groups and onboarding a new group? So essentially, uh, the application teams don't have permissions to manage the role binding, so it's essentially something that we will have to do, so there is more control there. Um, and also, the Octa group creation is not like everybody in the company can do either, so there are some protections and guardrails from that perspective. Uh, but if you're talking about like the payload in the HTTP request, that is more control through the regex mechanisms and the prefixes that you can set up so that the payload is not too large to be able to handle it. Okay, thank you. Thank you for a nice presentation. So my question is regarding the fine-grained access. Have you thought through or any plan for having, let's say, have your cluster with different namespaces and different teams are having access to those different namespaces and within that different resources, any like fine grade access like, okay, this team has access to this namespace, only read only within that also some resources are very restricted and stuff like that. So um, that's something that we would love to do in the future, but um, for now we considered um, or for now, we're more focused on the cluster-wide um, permissions because those are a lot more powerful than the namespaced, namespace scoped ones. But certainly, like we are aware that um, some applications maybe have more strict requirements than other ones. Um, so something that we have planned um, but have not worked on yet. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Actually, that previous question was basically identical to my own. I guess the, a follow-up that I had is I'm curious how much of this was manual as far as your team having to provision access and define what the scope of access is versus how much of it could be self-service. Like I imagine now you have a lot of teams and you having to manually sort of um, audit each request can be pretty daunting. Uh, so that's a great question. Uh, so when we first started, uh, as Karen was mentioning, everybody had star access, so it was not a problem when we first started. But we looked at the data and we provided them a little more granular access. But since then, we have not essentially received more requests because we were a lot more data-driven. We were looking at past 12 to 18 months of data. but. Yes, it is subject to change when more custom resources are added um, and things like that. But because we have uh, continuous deployment, it would be as simple as for them to submit a diff, um, and after that, everything is handled for them. And we have very fast-based rollout, especially for role bindings. That way, they can get their access in short duration and don't have to wait for days or hours. Got it. So they would make a PR, and you would approve it, and then it would get integrated. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, like so far we haven't had to do it, but if we, that is how we envision it to be done. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, just some context, I'm asking from the perspective of someone that works for a cloud service provider that is going to be building out an authorization management system on top of a managed Kubernetes offering, so I'm picking everybody's brains as far as how some of this works. So I guess last question would be, how different would you have designed things if you were designing this management system, not for um, internal users, so employees of your company, but for um, like B2B, like people whose data you might not have access to? Hmm. That's a very interesting question. Um, I would probably say um, not a lot would change, except we would probably start with very basic read-only access. And from there, people are able to kind of request access and add more permissions. But we would probably not be asking them to add permissions to like, oh, I want permissions to create my own role bindings, for example. So we would be a little more cautious there. But if they want more access, they can get it. But we'll be more data driven and probably revoke those permissions if it's unused for like last 30 days, for example. So to maintain the clean slate over and over again. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah.
Hey, thanks for the talk. Uh, I had a question on, feel free to correct me if my understanding of this is wrong, but you previously had gr Google Groups, people managing access to Teams via those Google Groups. Now you have Okta Groups, and Okta Groups are managing uh, the, the, binding, the, the role bindings and all that stuff. Yeah. Who was, like, how are you protecting that the same people can't modify those Okta Groups? And, and you have a duplicate, of, uh, some duplication of information there too, right? Uh, is, is that something you guys are trying to deprecate off Google? Like, what's the situation there? So part of the reason why we wanted to move from Google Groups to Okta Groups, we're still using Google Groups, you know, for all of the Google things. Yeah. <laughs> but um, the company was kind of centralizing on user, using Okta Groups for m accessing other things, like outside of Kubernetes. So it did make sense for us to use that as a well. Um, and as for the drift question, yeah, that's definitely something <laughs> that, were, that was in discussion when um, we were choosing which solution. And um, as for the management of Google Groups, it wasn't like a free-for-all where anyone could add or remove. Um, it was, there wasn't as much control for who could create Google Groups, but once it was created, then um, typically if it was like a team-based Google Group, then the manager would be the one who's allowed to add or remove people. Um, and as for drift of group membership, um, we don't have a solution <laughs> for that. Something that we had talked about um, was like syncing from um, directly from uh, like oh, like from workdays like team membership. But the reason that we didn't want to go for um, go for that is because sometimes that can be out of sync, and then you would have to you know do some right. manual changes there. Which is why we wanted to have the Octa groups that was just dedicated for Kubernetes access. And who's managing those Okta groups? Um, so that's managed by the security team. Yeah. Actually. Okay, so it's well audited. And yeah. Yeah, okay. and also like even if you create an Okta group, the membership is not granted by default. So you would still, we would still expect users to submit a request to be able to get access to the Okta group, and there will be a designated owners associated with the group itself who would be accepting uh, the request to join the group. And in some of the critical groups and role bindings, we made sure there are more than one layers of approvals so that it could be done by some of the admins or infra people so that it's more catered and more careful. Got it, makes sense. Thanks, guys. Yep. Thanks, everybody. So that's gonna be all the questions for this session. If it's okay, if you have other questions, you can meet when we step off stage and get ready for the next presentation. Thank you. Right. Thank you.